was of the opinion that um, market analysis in the in-out business uh, generally had become very politicised both within OPEC and the International Energy Agency uh, and he wanted to create something that was, was apart from those um, and would provide a genuinely independent view uh, which is what we have sought to do over the last uh, 20 plus years. Um, what I'd like to do in, in sort of the rest of, of the time up until we break the coffee is, is to um, build on what Oz has, has said um, about the, the sort of the subsurface um, in Russia and look at some of the uh, look at some of the um, sort of the above surface uh, issues uh, that companies face looking to invest in. Uh, what is, from a, from a geological perspective at least, a fairly substantial resource, um, as Oz has pointed out, although not without its difficulties. So, first, the good bits. Um, you know, whatever we think about uh, the government in Russia and the way that politics is, uh, is expressed in Russia, it is a stable country. Um, you compare um, the, the political risks um, of government change of loss of asset uh, in Russia with some of the other parts of the world in which our industry invests um, and stability is uh, certainly much greater in Russia than it is in many other parts of the world. And if we think back over uh, the real tumultuous times that Russia has been through uh, with the breakup of the Soviet Union, uh, the loss of a lot of its, uh, what it felt were its ter territories in surrounding countries, at the end of the 1980s, the beginning of the 1990s, the chaos uh, that Russia went through in the first years of its, uh, its independence in the first half of the 90s, the increased nationalism that we have seen uh, within Russia, uh, the growing um, reassertion of Russia's place both in the region and in the world since then, um, and yet the environment in, in its broad sense um, has remained uh, relatively stable. Currency is stable. Um, you can see uh, a, a US dollar uh, ruble exchange rate uh, up there at the top. Yes, there was wild gyrations around the time of the financial crisis, um, but since then uh, we haven't seen uh, significant devaluation of, of the ruble. Uh, that means that ruble, uh, ruble costs um, are, are relatively stable in dollar terms for. Um, for external investors. Other things that are potentially quite attractive is that despite um, the consolidation of the, the big uh, assets in, in the Russian oil sector into a relatively small number, between a relatively small number of predominantly or significantly state-owned firms, there are a lot of opportunities available. They're relatively small. Um, they are widespread. Uh, the map there shows the license blocks uh, that were offered for auction uh, in a relatively transparent manner during 2012. Um, so a very significant uh, number of blocks available, covering a wide number of basins. Very many of them, of course, uh, located just to the east of the Urals in West Siberia um, and down to the southern part of that but equally a significant number of, of opportunities opening up uh, in East Siberia, where the focus of, of much of Russia's uh, new uh, oil interest uh, is now located, some up just on the, the very north coast to the west of the Urals in the Timan Pachura Basin. Uh, again, another source or another focus uh, of Russian uh, oil activity. Staff are well educated. There's a long history of oil field development. There is a, uh, a, a long history of the oil industry in Russia. There is a good technical education system in Russia. There is um, a, a relative abundance of well-qualified uh, and often experienced local staff. And the entry and holding costs of, of assets are generally relatively low. There are um, obviously um, work requirements that go with the license, um, but they are generally not particularly onerous. There are restrictions um, on what 
foreign companies uh, can hold in terms of investments. There are legal restrictions on uh, foreign access to what the government has deemed strategic deposits. So that's anything over 500 million barrels of oil or 50 billion cubic meters of gas. Uh, there are very uh, tight restrictions on, on the proportion of, of any company uh, developing assets of both sides that can be held uh, by foreign companies. Offshore, um, shelf deposits are reserved for <coughs> Gazprom and Rosneft. Um, if you look at the licenses that are awarded, or look at the licenses in the Bering Sea, the Kara Sea, um, the Black Sea, uh, the Sea of Okotsk off the East Coast are all being awarded um, to Rosneft and Gazprom. Uh, they are the only companies within Russia at the moment that are eligible to hold those licenses, uh, both in terms of the share of government ownership in those companies, but also their experience. Um, so we're seeing that even a company like Gazprom Neft, uh, the old Sibnyak, uh, which is developing um, Russia, what should be um, Russia's first Arctic offshore production, um, the license for that is actually held not by Gazprom yet, but by its parent company, Gazprom, uh, because Gazprom yet is not allowed uh, to hold that license. The core areas are still very tightly controlled by the Russian oil majors, so for uh, foreign investors to come in is, is still a difficult process. Uh, Luke Oil uh, has a very a significant grip on um, assets in Timar Futura. Uh, the, the Russian oil company, <coughs> Big Four, uh, Rosneft, Look Oil, Soviet Nefty Gas, and Gas um, very tightly controlled much of West Siberia between them, uh, and increasingly the same is true in East Siberia. Um, although under attack, uh, Gazprom's monopoly on gas exports from Russia is still in place. If it does, um, if it does crumble, and it looks increasingly likely uh, that, that holes will be made in that monopoly, uh, those holes are likely to be restricted to uh, LNG exports, and then the breakup of that monopoly uh, for LNG exports is likely to be very tightly controlled. So access for anybody else to export LNG will probably uh, only be agreed on a project by project basis, uh, and it will probably only be agreed if the markets for uh, that LNG do not compete head on with the markets for Gazprom's pipeline gas uh, in Europe. So, uh, looking to invest in gas projects, uh, it's important to have uh, and to recognize uh, that it's important to have a, a relationship with Gazprom because they are ultimately going to be uh, the sole buyer uh, of gas for export. Uh, there are opportunities to uh, do deals for uh, local supply of gas within Russia, uh, but that market too is, is getting um, fairly tied up. No one has, has made um, big inroads into, into uh, gas from the domestic market. Um, and there are uh, opportunities, I think, still for that. How can one go about getting uh, access to um, assets in Russia? Uh, as I mentioned, auctions is, is one possibility. Um, they're generally announced twice a month on the Rosnedra uh, website. Uh, there are about 100, somewhere between 100 and 150 blocks uh, a year typically uh, are being auctioned at the moment. It's a relatively transparent process. Um, bids are submitted. Um, very often, uh, though, we see that, um, that there are uh, either a single bid per block, in many cases, no bids per block. Um, there are generally no initial drilling requirements, uh, and there are very few, if any, relinquishment requirements. Uh, the majors, the Russian majors, uh, tend not to compete for many of the blocks themselves outside their core areas. Um, obviously, if the, the, the big blocks, the big fields that were discovered in the Soviet era um, but not yet developed have now all been awarded. Uh, the last of those were awarded last year, and not surprisingly, 
uh, those all went to uh, the Russian majors. But outside of those, uh, there are, oh, there is relatively little uh, competition from the Russian majors in many of these auctions. There are drawbacks. Um, the process, the, the, the period of time uh, that companies have to put together bids is generally very short, um, and the paperwork requirements are considerable. Russia uh, still suffers from uh, the uh, very heavy Soviet era bureaucracy, uh, and there is little sign that those processes are really being streamlined uh, in any very effective way. There is often very limited geological and geophysical um, information available. Where it is available, um, it can be difficult to find. It's often spread over. Um, a wide number of agencies. Uh, it's not always compatible um, to one piece with another, uh, and that can make uh, the interpretation of, of what you're actually bidding for quite difficult. And uh, with the restriction on um, the strategic resources, uh, there is uh, the possibility that if you make a big discovery, uh, you won't be allowed to develop it. Um, but even if your discovery is not uh, deemed strategic, there is no current guarantee uh, that a production license will follow from a successful discovery. Uh, so the production license may well be uh, tendered uh, and awarded separately from an exploration license. There is pressure to change that, um, but it is still uh, a considerable risk. If you're not uh, keen on going through that route, then what about the possibilities for acquisitions? Uh, there's relatively uh, little in the way of, of transparent mergers and acquisitions activity. Uh, there are few truly independent companies uh, operating in uh, the Russian oil and gas space. Uh, there are one or two uh, that are developing either single assets or a very small uh, number of assets. They are generally um, very closely linked uh, to regional uh, political establishments, regional political figures, um, making them, I think, very difficult uh, to assess as uh, acquisition targets. There are, in, in many areas of the Russian oil sector, uh, still fairly strong cultural resistances uh, to foreign ownership. Um, valuation remains difficult just as it does for, uh, for um, the, 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 um, the licenses themselves up for auction. Valuation of companies is extremely difficult. Um, and the controls on acquisition of, of uh, companies developing strategic resources limit any involvement to a maximum of 20%. There are a number of foreign listed independent companies operating, uh, particularly in Russia and Kazakhstan. Uh, there is some movement uh, among those companies, uh, but again, they are generally uh, targeting relatively small numbers uh, of uh, assets, relatively small numbers of, of fields. Joint Ventures has been seen as one of the um, one of the, the favoured ways of uh, getting access into the oil and gas space in, in Russia uh, in particular. There have been some successful joint ventures. Uh, Sullen has been a, a, a successful venture. Samara and after, um, between Hess um, and Simon Fuchs, who, who has uh, a long history in TNK and other uh, companies in Russia, uh, has been very successful. There have been some extraordinarily unsuccessful uh, joint ventures as well. Uh, Naria and Gas, uh, the production profile of which is, is the bottom one there, a joint venture between Conoco Phillips and Look Oil, uh, really didn't live up to uh, anybody's expectations. And I, I think this uh, highlights in many ways uh, the risks of the uh, interpretation of geological information uh, that really didn't live up to uh, expectations once wells were put into the field. Now, you know, Timantura, Russia is not the only place where 
uh, oil fields who failed to perform uh, anything like uh, the way that, that geologists thought they would before the wells were drilled. Um, and I wouldn't want to uh, necessarily suggest that, uh, that, that Narium on left of gas is, is or the problems that they've experienced are necessarily uh, problems that are restricted to Russia, they're certainly not. Uh, offshore joint ventures, which is where all the noise has been about with the, uh, the majors uh, seeking a, a, a toehold in Russia recently, um, are very much projects for the majors. Uh, deep pockets are required. <coughs> this is um, I wouldn't call it green field exploration so much as white sea exploration. Um, the, the deals that ExxonMobil and Statoil and ENI um, have entered into with Rosneft uh, for exploration in the Arctic are, I, I think, at most optimistically part of a 20 year uh, portfolio. Um, even when uh, discoveries are made, if they are made, extracting anything from them is going to be extremely expensive. It is going to be uh, pushing the frontier of some of the technological and environmental uh, issues that will have to be dealt with. Um, and uh, in my view, particularly uh, if the discoveries of gas, there are going to be very serious questions over the marketability uh, of that gas uh, and what, what markets can actually reach with that gas, one only has to look at um, the fairly dismal um, performance of the Stockholm project in the Bering Sea, um, whose market has disappeared uh, with the advent of uh, shale gas in the United States. Uh, and Gazprom has finally um, admitted that uh, that project is now being reserved for quote unquote future generations. Um, and I'm not certain in my own view um, that many of the uh, the big exploration projects off Russia's Arctic coast uh, will yield anything that is much more attractive than stock run um, unless uh, companies start to find very significant quantities uh, of oil uh, rather than gas. Um, deep, so deep pockets and, and, and a long horizon uh, required for these big offshore projects. Uh, the ability to offer um, access to overseas project to your Russian partner um, is also seen as a significant uh, bonus. Um, Rosneft, Gazpromnet, uh, both looking to expand overseas, uh, although it's noticeable that um, at least the Gazpromnet, um, its initial forays outside of Russia have not been um, overly successful uh, and they are now starting to pull back certainly from some of their West African ventures. So, assessing opportunities, um, there is often lots of, of geophysical and geological data around, um, but as I've alluded to, it's not centralised, it's not always consistent, it's not internally um, consistent and it's often not compatible uh, with the sort of information that Western companies are used to uh, dealing with. It's very often not clear who actually owns uh, the data, uh, and there are um, some very um, strict regulations on uh, foreign access to data, uh, on the export of data outside of Russia. Um, much of the data, or the certain parts of the data, particularly uh, geographical data, is classified, um, which can make it extraordinarily difficult for expatriate staff foreign companies to access the data uh, and really, um, uh, really interpret that data. Um, and uh, as we're seeing, cost data um, of operations can be extremely difficult to, uh, to extract, uh, making it uh, in many cases difficult to uh, really evaluate the opportunities that are up for grabs. As Oz has pointed out, um, in much of Russia, uh, the terrain is extremely challenging. Um, moving uh, equipment around uh, over the, um, the, the, uh, the territory of Western Siberia in particular um, can be uh, an extraordinarily, di extraordinarily difficult uh, and expensive process. In many cases for 
um, certainly for uh, a lot of the developments, there is a requirement to uh, build roads, build well pads on uh, extremely marshy ground. Um, the, the view of the helicopter is a general view across um, part of, of uh, West Siberia. The top picture on the right um, is Rosneft's Bankhall field. Um, and uh, the snow there in that, that picture is not particularly heavy. Um, it can get much worse than that. Uh, the bottom picture on the right is uh, one of the one of the well pads that uh, was TNKBP now Rosneft's uh, summer floor field. Um, and this field is, is developed um, by use of a, 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 a huge network of, of uh, roads and artificial islands built out across uh, the lake and swamps uh, in West Siberia. So the terrain can be challenging, but not everywhere. Um, certainly as you go further south in Russia, um, as you go down into the Volga Urals Basin, um, the uh, geography is much more benign. Uh, the ease of transporting equipment uh, is, is uh, significantly greater. Um, you are then starting to look uh, at areas that uh, don't look quite so dissimilar uh, to some of the um, some of the areas of production on shore in the United States. Um, so once you get out of the, the harsh West Siberian environment, uh, things do begin to look a lot uh, a lot easier from a uh, a movement point of view and, and, and the uh, the access to equipment. There are beyond the uh, the sort of physical um, challenges, uh, various other considerations. Oz um, has pointed out uh, some of the tax structure. Um, this graph shows over time the uh, mineral extraction tax and the export duty. Uh, there are tax breaks um, for uh, certain classes of fields. There are tax breaks for uh, some of the offshore fields. There are tax breaks for some of the uh, developments in East Siberia. There is uh, certainly a great deal of talk about tax breaks for hard to recover oil, um, which may be heavily depleted fields. It may be highly viscous oil. Um, it may be tight oil. Um, those are in discussion at the moment. One of the problems with the tax breaks to date uh, is that they have been largely piecemeal um, and they have been very often been granted on a field by field basis. Uh, so it can be extremely difficult to um, judge in advance whether your particular project will um, benefit from tax breaks. Uh, and with the the case of the tax breaks in East Siberia, um, they were uh, put in place on a rolling monthly basis. So you had no um, uh, no, no confidence uh, that those tax breaks would last uh, for long enough uh, because you were dependent on uh, the Ministry of Finance agreeing month by month that that tax break should be extended. There is a heavy reporting burden, again, um, a hangover from uh, past bureaucracy. There are very detailed, or very detailed field development plans are required, uh, which must be approved at each step. Um, customs clearance uh, can uh, be a very lengthy process. There are a number of companies that have um, complained about uh, the, the long delays in getting equipment through Russian customs which have had a significant uh, negative impact uh, on their operations. Access to export infrastructure can be a problem. Uh, I remember some years ago talking to uh, a foreign investor in Russia who was complaining uh, that as a small producer in Russia, uh, they were always at the bottom of the list for the allocation of export directions, which meant that their oil always ended up going uh, on the route that nobody else wanted, where the net backs were worse. Um, the company that the gentleman worked for was a little company called Royal Dutch Shell. Um, so if that's a small producer complaining about access to, to uh, export infrastructure, um, I rather wonder um, how easy it would be for, um, for a genuinely small uh, company to do so. 
There are other issues such as the lack of a quality bank um, on the uh, pipeline export system. Uh, that may work in your favor if the, uh, the oil that you're um, producing is inferior uh, to the quality of uh, Russia's Ural's export grade, uh, but it will work in your, uh, to your, to your um, detriment if you're producing anything better than Ural's. There are, of course, opportunities to um, use the rail network. There are significant volumes of, of oil exported by rail, um, both to neighboring countries, but also to um, open water uh, export terminals, but they are uh, significantly more expensive. So where are the opportunities? Um, and, and what are, are some of the um, potential attractions? Well, the consolidation of the industry in Russia, I think, works both ways. Um, it means that there are fewer and fewer big companies uh, operating the big assets in Russia. But what that does do is to release um, a number of very experienced, uh, often very well-connected uh, executives at all levels uh, from Russian companies who um, see their future uh, in the uh, independent sector, in the Russian oil space. Um, those uh, can make very useful partners uh, for uh, would-be foreign investors <coughs> with careful choices, of course. Um, both brownfield and greenfield acreage is available. There are exploration opportunities, but there are also opportunities to uh, operate um, old aging fields um, throughout the Russian oil space. Uh, as uh, Oz, I think, pointed out, uh, opportunities for enhanced oil recovery uh, and for late life field management um, are fairly abundant in Russia. There is a growing interest in hard to recover and unconventional liquid resources. Uh, there's no interest in unconventional gas resources, uh, certainly from Gazprom uh, at the moment and with the um, the dependence on Gazprom for pipeline exports, very little outside of Gazprom. Uh, but there is an interest in unconventional liquids. Uh, there is, I, I think, among uh, the Russian oil sector um, a growing understanding uh, that the Bajanov uh, has the potential, uh, and I would uh, stress at the moment it is very much a potential uh, to be a significant uh, producer of high quality oil uh, for Russia. There are uh, still obstacles to be overcome, particularly in the taxation of production. Um, nevertheless, it is an area uh, that, that the country is extremely interested in. And for me, always, um, what was interesting about the ExxonMobil Rosneft deal uh, was actually less the Arctic exploration uh, and more the little phrase that was tucked away at the bottom uh, of the press release uh, that suggested that the two companies would also explore uh, the potential for tight oil production uh, across Rosneft's onshore assets. Um, and I'm sure that was for, for Exxon, that was a big part of uh, at least the near term benefit of that deal. So there are uh, the opportunities for technological partnerships with Russian companies. Um, that technology uh, increasingly is necessary. Uh, to maintain production and to grow production, not necessarily on a national level, uh, but certainly on a corporate level. Now, I realize that, that both Oz and I have, have spoken very much about, um, about Russia. Um, I know Rosemary is going to, to talk a little bit later on, um, perhaps about um, uh, the, the Caspian Sea region much more. Um, I would like to, to just finish off with a, a couple of sort of fairly broad observations um, about this other part of the, the former Soviet Union. Um, in terms of Azerbaijan, I think the question has to be asked, are we running out of opportunities? Um, offshore, uh, the oil exploration that took place during the, 19, the late 1990s and into the beginning of, of the 2000s was largely un 
successful. Companies are starting to revisit um, some of those contract areas with a focus on natural gas. That gas is uh, generally pretty deep. Uh, reservoirs are five to six kilometers of depth, um, generally high pressure. Um, but we are starting to see uh, the export infrastructure um, beginning to take shape to be able to monetize that gas. Um, so I think there are um, future opportunities uh, in, in offshore gas. Um, and as a question, onshore, uh, the oil is largely depleted. Um, there are some relatively small opportunities, I think, um, but they're, they're uh, at the moment, looks unlikely to be uh, very significant onshore opportunities in Azerbaijan. In Kazakhstan, we're awaiting uh, the lifting of a moratorium on the awarding of offshore licenses. Um, so there could be some opportunities for offshore exploration um, in Kazakhstan. I think in, in the Caspian Sea region generally, um, personal relationships are extremely important. Um, you know, we, we've seen uh, the, 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 uh, the, the emplacement of the Aliyev dynasty um, in Azerbaijan. Um, we still have in Kazakhstan the same president uh, that we had at independence. Um, relationships, I think, are key to, um, to, to getting the job done uh, in these areas. And of course, as you go to the eastern Caspian Sea, there is increasing competition uh, from Chinese investors, um, whether they be Chinese state companies uh, or notionally um, uh, the semi-private companies in China uh, who are looking to uh, strengthen their position uh, in uh, Kazakhstan and Central Asia generally. Um, the, the biggest of these, or the biggest outstanding issue at the moment is waiting to see whether Monaco um, Phillips successfully sells his stake in Kashagan uh, to India, uh, or whether in fact that goes, as many now think it will, uh, to the Chinese as well. Uh, in Turkmenistan, uh, offshore exploration has proved an extraordinarily slow process. Um, Petronas is, is producing oil and gas uh, offshore, but others who have been um, pursuing exploration contracts off the coast of Turkmenistan uh, have faced very, very slow progress. Uh, onshore, uh, there is uh, the, the opportunities are for service contracts only. Um, companies that have been holding out for uh, PSAs in Turkmenistan uh, have played and are continuing to play and probably will continue to play um, a very long waiting game. Um, so the opportunities there are, um, I, I would suggest, are relatively limited uh, unless you're prepared to play, play um, a service company type role um, and have personal contacts to make that work. Um, in terms of export infrastructure, the export infrastructure does exist. This is um, part of a, um, a mapping of, of uh, oil and gas infrastructure in the former Soviet Union that we have um, undertaken. We, we plotted um, all of the major uh, pipelines, the major fields uh, throughout the former Soviet region, uh, right down to the level of individual pumping stations and, and uh, export terminals. Um, you can see that there, there is a very significant um, export infrastructure uh, for gas in red, for oil in blue, um, out of the Caspian region. At the moment, uh, the gas export infrastructure runs either eastwards into China uh, or northwards into Russia. I personally am very skeptical um, about Trans-Caspian pipelines carrying oil or gas uh, from Central Asia westwards. Um, less because of the uh, arguments over ownership of the Caspian Sea um, and more because at the moment uh, any such pipelines would have to transit, well they will not just at the moment have to transit, but any such pipelines will have to transit Azerbaijan uh, and at the moment um, Azerbaijan's focus is very much particularly in the gas field on selling its own gas into Europe and the last thing it wants 
is competing supplies from Turkmenistan or anywhere else, um, giving it a, a, a run for its money um, in, in uh, time contracts in Europe. Once Azerbaijan has sold its gas in Europe, and it's not just the Shakhtanese too, but it's, it's all of the, the, the long list of gas projects that, that Azerbaijan is looking at um, in the years ahead, whether it's deep gas below the Azeri Shirak Dimension field, whether it's Babe, Bumi, Absheron, all of these projects. Um, once that gas has been contracted, then Azerbaijan might seriously consider a trans caspian gas pipeline, but I don't uh, see much chance of it doing so before then. Um, so that does limit um, the options for getting certain gas out of Central Asia. Um, oil is a bit easier. Um, you can put it on a, on a tanker or a barge and ship it across the Caspian. Um, it was always assumed that uh, the onward export route for that would be uh, through the Baku to Busi Jehan pipeline uh, out to the Mediterranean. Um, that hasn't really worked as people had anticipated it would do, um, largely because the Azerbaijan State Oil Company um, has been demanding that uh, would be shippers of third party oil through that pipeline sell their crude uh, to SOCAR, to, to the state company um, on the Azeri coast. Um, and it then effectively becomes Azerbaijani oil. Um, this, uh, together with um, the relatively high uh, pipeline tariffs, has not been uh, an attractive option for uh, producers like Tengen and Chevrolet. Uh, the result of which is that the back of the JR pipeline is operating at something like 60% of capacity. Um, even uh, with that underutilization, uh, there has as yet been little movement on the part of, of the Azerbaijanis. Uh, they have been buying uh, oil from Turkmenistan, uh, which is supplementing in a small way uh, the volumes of their own oil. Uh, but this is still not seen, uh, in my mind anyway, as, a, um, a, a, as a, an attractive one with export route uh, from the Caspian. There are opportunities to send oil across the Caucasus by rail, um, or to put it into the Russian pipeline system and take it out through the number assist. Um, but then again, uh, you run into the problems of the lack of uh, quality bank uh, and the negative impact that that can have if you're producing high quality oil. So I hope that's a sort of food for thought. Um, it is a difficult place uh, to invest. It's always been a difficult place to invest. And I, I sort of to finish up, to sort of take you back to um, the first days of the Soviet Union, um, when after the revolution, uh, Lenin realized that the oil fields, uh, the revolution in the First World War, and Lenin realized that the oil fields around Baku, which at the time were the mainstay of Soviet oil production, um, had been um, badly damaged and badly looked after and that the only way that these fields could be rehabilitated was with uh, the money and the technology uh, that was in the hands of foreign oil companies. Um, and so in, I think it was 1920, uh, the Soviet Union invited foreign oil companies to come and invest in the Baku, in rehabilitating the Baku oil fields. Um, companies came, the oil fields were rehabilitated, uh, production rose significantly, by, 20, uh, by 1926, every single foreign oil company had been thrown out of the country. Um, they were no longer deemed necessary. Um, so um, the opportunities are there, um, but beware. Thank you. <laughs>
you in 20 minutes.